we praise God for all that he has been doing in our lives, and we praise him for an another year. We praise him not only for another year, but for many of us, many chances. <laughs> you know, the new year gives us chances to change, to do different things, and just to acknowledge how good God has been. If we missed out on sharing the gospel with other people, then this is a year for us to do it, right? So water under the bridge. 2017 is totally over. Last time I was here, we talked about the blessings of God doing new things, a new thing in our lives, and so 2018 can be a year of a whole lot of new things. And so I praise God also last week, uh, Brother Oscar reminded us as well, I heard in part of the message there, he was talking about upward and onward, that if indeed in this year, it's a, it's a simple solution, John, if in this year you lose your way, Look to the place where you last saw the light. Amen? Look to the place where you last saw the light because the light of God's word is always, always shining. No matter what is going on in your life, God's light cannot be stifled. If you find yourself in darkness, it's easy to find the light. So let's have a word of prayer and we begin our message for today. Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we ask for your Holy Spirit. Hide me behind the cross that Jesus may clearly be seen. In his name we pray. Amen and amen. I'll ask the gentleman um, if you can bring the dry erase board. We have a dry erase board there. We're going to put some things on there. Can we have two or three guys to bring out the dry erase board? If we can put it up here, I'd like to make an illustration. So, in 2018... People are setting goals. We've been setting goals, right? Everybody's always setting goals for the new year, and rightfully so, right? Last year, when we talk about the new year, I mentioned goals again because everybody wants to do things for this new year. Um, by the way, we're almost at January 15th, which is Monday, because they say if you pass the 15th, then generally you have a chance at your resolutions. But most of the times, our resolutions fail by the time January 15th rolls around because many people say, I'm, I'm going to set the health goals, and I'm going to reach my health goals because every year I want to lose weight, right? And then everybody buys the gym membership, and, um, and the gym is packed on January the 2nd, the 3rd, and by January the 7th, it starts dimming down, and by January the 15th, it's back to where it was last year. And so don't worry, I'm there with you. <laughs> I, I started out 2017 like that as well, bought a gym membership. First time in my life, Brother Oscar, I never bought a gym membership before. No <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> she has good penmanship. Maybe she can do it. Okay, there you go. Big and bold, big and bold. <laughs> so, yeah, I bought the gym membership, and, um, and it, it started out well. I actually lasted beyond the uh, 15 because I had Jeremy Smith. Remember Jeremy? Jeremy was working me, boy. He was working me, working me good. But well, of course, my goal was not to be, of course, it's not to be big and buff, right? It's, it's a hard, hard, I'm a hard gainer. But I wanted to get back in military shape as far as speed and endurance is concerned. And so I did that. But it's like once I kind of, you know, did the little Navy test and I kind of saw the way I was, I'm like, well, it's like, well, you know, that's it. That's good enough. That's good enough. So I started phasing off, like everyone else, that's how we do it. I started dropping off. So one week, Jeremy would be there waiting, and I'd be home sleeping. <laughs> you know, Chance, where you at? Man, you know what? Some things came up. And so it became easier and easier and easier to make excuses. And then pretty much, it's just like everyone else. So the gym membership has not been used. I called the gym. I said, hey, can we cancel our gym membership? He said, Mr. Chance, if you try to cancel your gym membership now, you'll have to pay for the entire year. I'm like, wow, okay, well, let's just tough it out then. So if that's been your case, that's life, right? That's just how it goes sometimes. What other goals have we had for the year? Anybody have some New Year's resolutions and goals? What do you want to achieve for this New Year? I'm going to share with you a simple process and formula that can help you achieve any single goal that you want to achieve in this New Year. So what are some goals that you have for this year? Anybody? Don't be shy. Ooh. Anybody has any goals for the year? Nobody said goals? Learn more, about Learn more about Jesus. Amen. So you want more knowledge? 
Anybody else? What are the goals we have for the, for the year? Come on, talk to me, young people. Lose weight. Hey, Amen. Come on, let's be brave, right? That's really, that's mainly the main thing. Lose weight. Anything else? Kemas. Bible reading. Okay, so we put that under more knowledge as well, right? More money. More money. Amen. I'm glad to hear somebody say that. So, income, money. <laughs> so, yeah, be debt free, right? We want to be debt free. That's an awesome goal. We, hey, that's a goal we've had, right? And we keep missing it. So, hey, it's a new year. We can start again, right? Yes, sir. More oh, oh, man, praise the Lord. We, we got to desire the spiritual gifts, the spiritual stuff, too, right? So, we need patience. Hallelujah. Anything else? Two more. Two more. From this side. We've had some this side. Give, give this side. I want two from this side right here, this column. What goals... Should we set for the for the new year? What do we want to accomplish in our lives? Money, yes, it's, it's right there. Good. Anything else? Amen. To share the gospel. Amen. Wonderful goal. Okay. So better health, right? Health and share the gospel. Okay. So this is wonderful. This is wonderful. So while we're looking at achieving all of these goals, there are many strategies, of course. You know, people read all kinds of self-help books and these different things. And so this is great. So any one of those things is good. If you check them out and you want to try any of them, it's great. As a church and as a pastor, though, I, this morning my goal is to share with you how from the Bible you can be able to achieve those things because many times we don't apply the Bible even into those areas because we say they are secular, okay? So nonetheless, let's go through here. So this is a process that I personally use for any and everything as far as goal setting and achievement is concerned. Input plus process equals outcome or results. Another way of saying it is input plus system equals results. So here's how I pray because this is how we generally pray. And so I'm going to share with you. So we pray for these things. Right? Because this is what we want. We want the outcome. We want the results. And so many times, this is what we focus on. We focus on these things. I want to lose weight. I want to do these things. And this is good. This is not nothing wrong with that. But I want to give you a different perspective because praying for these things is already a reality with God. It's pretty much already done. Like they say, um, success is really automatic and predictable. Right? For example... Has there been hundreds of thousands, yeah, millions of people who have lost weight and are losing weight? So therefore, there's a strategy to doing it. Isn't it so? Right? Um, are there people who have become debt-free and know how to become debt-free, earn money, save money, and so forth? Right? So they know how to do it. Um, same thing, Bible. So pretty much, so that's why we say success, outcomes, results are predictable. What guarantees the, pred the predictable outcome is here is the input. What do I need to put in in order to achieve this outcome? So let's take, we go, we try to imagine a line here. So Bible knowledge. If I want to increase my Bible knowledge, what do I need to put in? Time. Amen. What else? Right? So we got to study. So that's my part. Memorize. Forgive the writing. So lose weight. Input. Exercise, okay, so we need nutrition or diet, All right, okay. Uh, income, if we want more income or to become debt free, what do we need to do? What, do, what, what input can we put in? <laughs> hey, that's practical, right? Work more, that's one. Some folks got three or four jobs and still not making it. So we need to work more, put in overtime, right, OT. Uh, my brother said to save and less spending, right? Cut down on your spending some, okay? Maybe cut up a credit card, right? Perform surgery on those credit cards, right? Uh, you probably would need to do that. 
Budgeting, oh yes, we don't like budgeting though. Budgeting is like, you feel so restricted, right? Okay, so let's put budget there. Now, um, okay, so if I want to share the gospel, what input should I have to? Pray, oh man, good, good. Let's come down here. Pray, what else? Study, the same thing up here. Study and read, yes sir. We got to read the Bible. We need to study it. And we got we to prepare. And also time. I mean, all of these will require time. Time is always an input, right? Time is always an input. Vanessa just completed her bachelor's degree, right? So that's the outcome. That's what we, oh Lord, help me to finish my degree. The degree is already finished. Everybody's finishing degree every single year. But you need to what? Put in your time, put in your money. And that's something we got to put there too. Put some money here. Because even to become debt free, sometimes you got to put in some money. So that's investment. You have to put in the input so you can get the results. So in other words, here's another way of putting it, right? The Bible says, whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also. In other words, the reaping is automatic. So that's why, again, we apply the Bible. Success, outcome, results are automatic. The sowing determines the reaping. Make sense? If you want the good health, you've got to sow these good practices over this side. If you want more scripture knowledge, you've got to put in good over this side. So like they say sometimes, garbage in, garbage out. Mediocrity in, <laughs> don't expect to get excellence out over this side. So in other words, that's what I'm saying. This side takes care of itself. What you and I need to focus on is on this side. Perspective. So here's what we're praying for. God already says, hey, you want that? I already give that. All my words and promises already have these in place. It's already a completed action. Now he says, are you willing to wake up on time? Are you willing to study my word? Are you willing to eat the way I said to eat? Are you willing to do the exercise? So what I need to pray for, God, give me the discipline to exercise. Because if I do that and I eat right, this will be my outcome. Lord, help me to be able to read my Bible and study and memorize these scriptures so that when the time comes for me to share the gospel, I can do that. Does it make sense? So pray more on this side. But here's the thing now. This is where we need a third element, a second element, which is, is a process. Because here's the thing. Sometimes we say in our culture, work harder. We need to work hard. And that is true, but it's not always true in every case because sometimes working harder is not the solution. It is not. So I got to pray harder. I got to do this harder. I got to work more hours. I got to do all these things. And we're still behind, right? So the answer is not necessarily working harder. What if you're working harder doing the wrong things? <laughs> right? We're putting in a whole lot of sweat equity, and it's like, hey, you know what? We're not doing the right thing. So working harder is not necessarily the answer, but the answer can help you by having a good process or a good system. There we go. Busyness is not a sign of productivity. A whole lot of folks busy at the end of the day. What did you accomplish? I don't know, but I was busy. <laughs> right? I was busy. So here's the thing. So now, let's put this on there. So now, let's take lose weight. Let me give you some examples of how this can look. So lose weight, if you want to lose weight, we know we got to put in the time. But is there a system that can help us lose weight? Several. So have you heard of P90X? That's a system, right? T25, that's another system. Have we heard of that? The eight laws of health. Chip program. That's a system that will help you to do this financially. We know we have to be patient. We got to make the budget. We got to do all that. But some people don't know how to make a budget. Or they don't know what to do when they still can't you know, match up the budget and so forth. So you need a system. So there is FPU, Financial Peace University, for example. You take Financial Peace University, it's a system to attain in financial um, abundance and, and so forth and whatnot. So that's the problem. So a lot of people still struggling financially, even though they're doing the things they need to do, working an extra job and doing all these things, but there are other areas in your finances that you're not aware of because you don't have a map, you don't have a road map, right? Crown Financial Ministries has also, they have a seven-step strategy that's perfect. That's the one I use. 
when I first learned about money from a biblical perspective, was using that system. Studying. Here's another thing, right? So you want good grades. That's the outcome. Now you got to put in the time. Because if we don't study, we don't do our part, we're not going to get good grades. So here's the thing now. Can you get a tutor? Right? Tutoring could be a system of tutoring. Get somebody who understands. And there's study habits, how to memorize fast, how to do these different things. So in other words, you can sh shorten your learning curve, or you can apply the best strategy to be able to do stuff over here. So let's look at it another way. So if you want, uh, OK, let's look at this. This is made of plastic. OK, this is made of plastic. So let's say on the outcome, you wanted to get over here a dry erase marker, okay? That's made of plastic. So that's your outcome, that's the results. But what if over here, Brother Hassel, we put in metals, steel? Are you gonna get a plastic eraser over there? No, but what if you have a perfect system? The same system they use, you have the assembly line, you have everything together, you have a great system. Nothing wrong with the system, but we have 40 inputs you're still not going to get the outcome. Are we there? So that's how you can now begin to test whether, how come it's not working? The system is good, da da da, but I'm still not getting the results. I'm putting in my time, I'm doing these type of things, but I'm still not getting the results. Somewhere on the input. So most of the times, it's not really the system. You got to tweak the system sometimes because the system might not be for you. Or you might have to modify it, right? So. Losing weight, one plan doesn't necessarily fit all, right? Some people have different diet needs and different things like that. So we have to adjust the process. But generally, like we said, most of the time, the process takes care of itself. Find a different process. That's another thing. We keep beating our heads against this process. If it's not working, guess what? Do something else. So it's the same thing. Evangelism. We can put over here church growth, evangelism, soul winning, all of those things. But what system and process are we using to be able to have better outcomes as a church? And if the system is not working, find one that does. Find one that fits us. Keep tweaking until we get there, but also input. Bible studies are there. Who, who's giving Bible study? If nobody's giving Bible study, how can we get the souls that we need over here? So that's what I'm saying. To me, it's a simple process. This, this right here is the simplest tool that I have to help me ascertain whether or not I can achieve anything on this side. Business, is that a fair thing to say as well? If you need more customers, that's over here. But there's some things you got to do over here. If nobody is calling the customers, how are you going to close people? Right? Nobody want to make no phone calls, but we want more customers and more income. We can't do that. We got to do something. Then you have your billing system, right? Processing, credit card processing. You have another one that handles um, the, 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 the CRM. And, and so you have a whole lot of systems in your office. That's why you can run a successful operation. Are we there? Now. For this morning's message, here's what I want to say. Anybody got the bulletin? Is it on the screen there? What's today's title? The title of my message this morning is one that's going to help you to be able to achieve or change any habit that you have in life. Any habits, right? So let's erase this as best we can. Can I have an assistant? Help me erase that. Someone help me to erase that. So because 2018 is important to us and what we want to, not the, not the headings, but just those columns. Now, anything that you want to change in this new year can be done, biblically speaking, in one system, in one process, in one way. It is a secret formula that no matter what sin you're struggling with, no matter what habit you want to change, no matter what it is, Barbara, you can actually change. Is anybody interested in knowing what that is? Right? Because here's the thing. The reason why generally we're not achieving over here is because of habits, isn't it so? And many goals that we have are also about habits. Because here's the thing. If I want to exercise more, is that a, is that a habit? That's, that has to do with habits. If I'm studying less and I need to study more, it's a habit issue. If I need to pray and I'm not praying, it's a habit issue. And so what, in, a, in essence, what we're really saying is I want to develop better habits. Because your habits will dictate how well you do on this side. And not only that, but the reason I'm touching on this is because as God's people, we fail to call our habits by their rightful name, which is sin. Prayerlessness is a sin. 
Not reading your word is a sin. Failing to witness and share your faith is a sin. But so that's what we are struggling with, Martha, is sins. And so therefore, God has a solution for dealing with the sin. Deal with the sin problem, and now you can develop the kind of habits that he wants you to develop. Forgetfulness is a sin. If you're chronically forgetting every single thing and so forth, and you, you know, that can lead to sin. So what we're saying is these habits that are in the Christian's life, you know, I try to break the movie habit, I try to break all these different things, and I just keep being tripped up over them. Many a times they are sin. Not always, but I'm just saying generally speaking, that's why we call them bad habits. If they were good habits, we don't have no issues with them, do we? But bad habits, we call them bad habits because they're bad for us. They are delaying the blessings that we have. So that's what I'm saying. Don't pray so much on this for this year. I know it might be counterproductive, but let me tell you, it is indeed productive. You keep praying for this over here. There's a reason why you haven't gotten it. The problem is here. You're not praying. So what do you expect over there? God, Because God gives conditions. That's the scripture reading we read this morning. God gives conditions. He gives laws. He gives principles. And your obedience to them, you see, we come back to that very word that many Christians don't like. We come, your obedience to the principles will dictate the blessings that you have over here. It is very, very predictable. Every and any area of your life that you want to improve Relationships, they are not good because we're not putting in the time. <laughs> we're not doing what we need to do. And so, therefore, that's what it is. So now, bro Brother Joe, here's the thing. I want you to turn with me. And you're going to identify it right away. We're going to go to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah. And I want you to realize this morning, and listen to me. I'm making a bold claim here now. I am telling you that there is a secret formula for changing any, overcoming any struggle, overcoming any bad habit, achieving anything in the spiritual life. And here it is. Are you ready for it? Hello? Anybody there? Jeremiah chapter 31. Because remember, most of the things that we want to do are habitual. And the habits of life flows from the heart or the mind, all right? If you've read the book, Mind, Character, Personality, Servant of the Lord says, how do we form habits? She said they start with the thoughts. From the thoughts flow the words, and the words lead to actions, and repeated actions form habits and hence our character. And that's why we can't achieve these goals because it is who we are. So that's why even if the man or woman who is chronically in debt, you give them a million dollars tomorrow or a few months later on or a year, they go right back to debt. Why? Because of their character that they have developed through repeated actions, habits that are hard to break. Prayerlessness, you know why we can't pray? Because we have developed the habit of not praying. So that's who I am at this moment. I'm a prayerless person. And so that's why you tell me, wake up in the morning early to pray. No, I've not accustomed myself to that. So therefore, I'm used to these two-minute prayers. And so therefore, guess what happened? When you tell me I need to pray for an hour and so forth, it sounds strange or ridiculous. But here's the thing. You want greater power out here? You better increase your power over there. It's not going to happen. It's not rocket science. And in the natural, Brother Joe, you know, you're, you're a professional man. In the natural, we get these things. But when it comes to spiritual, it's like we just leave our brains at the door. Right? You are a lawyer, you went to school, isn't it so? And you got a degree. You had to put in that work. I didn't care how much you pray, you got to go back and study, right? And no matter how much you pray, you couldn't go to the dean and say, you know what, uh, or the registrar, hey, I'm a Christian, I'm praying, and I want my tuition paid. They said, no, Mr. No, Mr. Flores, we don't operate on that principle here. Bring your money, and then you can get into the next semester. Go back and tell your church principal. more. <laughs> Because we didn't see the money yet. So that's the reality. You can't go to the Sally May and tell them, you know, hey, I'm a Christian, so, you know, default on my student loan. Or you go to the mortgage company and say, hey, you know, I'm serving the Lord. I'm doing great things. You know, can you? No, no. Hey, Mr. Chance, we need our funds today. We don't operate like that. Take care of your business. And that's reality. That's reality. So don't get so spiritual on these things. God wants us to be practical Christians. Are we there? 
practical Christians in the new year because I'm hearing us praying a whole lot of things. We can pray till we're blue. This is not going to come down until some of us put some money towards it. Are we there? Now, we got to pray. Don't get me wrong. Praying is part of the system, but there's more that is required. After you pray, then you're going to say, go do something. Right? You don't pray to me, I already give the blessings. The money is really in our pockets. The money is there. But, hey, it takes time because our faith has not yet reached up to it. So, Jeremiah, this is my number one secret. Jeremiah chapter uh, 31, I said chapter 31. Let's jump down to verse number 31. And here it is. You're going to get it right away. You're going to get it right away. Behold, the days come, says the Lord. Are we there? First of all, let's make sure we're there so I don't mess you up. All right? All right? 31. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will do what? What kind of covenant? A new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant or the old covenant that I made with their fathers, right? Not that old covenant. Verse 33, but this shall be the covenant, which is the new covenant, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will do what, everybody? I will put my laws where? In their inward parts, and I will write them where? And I will be their God, and they shall be my? And they shall teach no man anymore, what? His neighbor, and every man his neighbor say, or brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will do what, everybody? I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins all the time. No, I will remember their sins some of the times. I will remember their sins no more. Now, we said in December as we were closing out the year, that God is going to do a new thing. There are many new things that God does. But one of the new things that he says I have also is a new covenant. And under that new covenant, there's a whole lot of stuff that's going to change for you and for me. And the problem with the believers is we have not yet fully accepted the covenant, the new covenant agreement. We have not yet fully accepted or embraced it. Okay, so what else is contained in this new covenant? I want us to get it all in context and then we can talk about it. So let's go to um, Ezekiel. Let's jump, just jot over a little bit. Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel 36, are we there? As you are turning. And I'm going to start with verse number 25. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse number 25. Are we there? All right, it says, then I will sprinkle clean water upon you. And what's going to happen when I do that? You shall be clean. From how much? From all of your filthiness and from your idols, I will cleanse you. 26 again, a new heart also will I give you. And what else? I'm not just giving you a new heart. I'm giving you a new one. A new spirit. I will put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will also do something else. I'm going to give you a heart of, and verse number 27 now, and I will put my spirit in you. When my spirit is in you, what will be the result? I will cause you <laughs> to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments, and you shall, 29, I will save you from, Come on, my brothers and sisters, have you received this new covenant experience with Almighty God? And furthermore, if you have received, you see, in the Jewish economy, we call this, this is like the Ketubah covenant. Ketubah covenant is when a man is trying to marry a woman, and here are the agreements. These are the contracts that you are entering into. And under this new agreement, husband pledges this, wife pledges this. Here is the thing. Have we entered into a marriage agreement with Jesus Christ? Yeah or nay? Have we? Are you in a, in a covenant relationship, a marriage with, with Jesus Christ? How many of you have been baptized here? Let me see. Hey, that's your marriage, Romans chapter 4. I mean, Romans chapter 6. When you enter into water grave of baptism, we experience what the Bible calls a new birth, John chapter 3. This new birth experience creates... New habits, new desires, new everything. Not some things, he says, but all things. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. What does this say, everybody? When we come to Christ in this new covenant relationship, what happens? Anybody knows 2 Corinthians 5, 17? How much has become new for the believers? Whoever is in Christ, all things are become new. What is this all things that he's talking about? All things. <laughs> all things have become new. Where you going, Pastor? Come on, break it down. Stop keeping it, us in suspense. Well, we're getting there. Think about it. Precept upon precept, line upon line. We go back to the New Covenant. The New Covenant experience says, this is way back Old Testament. He says, and by the way, actually it was mentioned also in, in, in Genesis, Genesis 17. God created covenants with his people. And with a covenant is what? It's a contract. It's an agreement between at least how many people? At least two people. So two people come into this contract agreement, and there is one party's part and the other party's part. And so when they abide by the contract, then we are, you know, we are living out our words. We are saying what we mean and meaning what we say. Now here's the thing. When one party breaks the contract, what can happen? Now they can still abide by the contract. We can forgive one another. But breaking a contract is rules for annulling the contract. And so sometimes we have said we made contract with the Lord. Be careful when you make a contract. I don't want to make no contract with God at all. None. <laughs> Why? Because what weight am I bringing to make a contract with the God of the universe? But here's how we make contracts, Heather. This is how I make contracts sometimes in the past. Lord, if you deliver me this one more time, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. And no sooner has the deliverance come, here I am back in my miry clay. Have you had that experience, brothers and sisters? All right? So now, God says on Mount Sinai, he brought his people out of Israel, and he made a contract with them. That's the first, he said, this is the covenant now he's making with the people. And the people said, all that you said, we will do. You said we need to, over here, have Bible studies. Lord, if you says it, we're going to do it. So we will make ourselves do it over here. And here's the thing, and the Bible we do not read. Lord, you want us to pray. That's part of your covenant agreement. No problem, God. We will do all the praying. And so we say, okay, on this side, I'm going to pray like crazy, Brother Hassel. And here's the thing. Day number one, 10 days of prayer, we're praying. Day number two, we're praying. Day number three, we're praying. Praise God, after three days, great things happen. Day number four, well, you know, it's not so serious. Day number five, it's not so By day number six, we ain't praying no more. We're not praying anymore. Contract, broken. Agreement, broken. And that's what? Sin. So the people says, we're going to do all of these wonderful things. We're going to be holy. We're going to do these things here, God, and we fail. We fall short of his glory. We fall short. So God says, this cannot work. You have broken my covenant time and time again. You and your fathers, your forefathers, everybody have broken my covenant. So now, this is what I love now. Praise God. God is saying, I have a new secret formula for all of us, we are spiritual Israel. Amen. This is not just for the house of Israel. This is for you and this is for me. So he's saying now, this new agreement, Wani, I am going to make the covenant, but the carrying out of the covenant is totally different. It's totally different. Let's jump back real quick. Keep your hands on Ezekiel, but let's go back real quick to Jeremiah chapter 31. And notice the difference. Brother Judy, you ready for this? Because I'm giving you the one secret formula, brother. There's no other formula. Like, forget all the other stuff. You want to try uh, P90X, T25, uh, Financial Peace Universe. It doesn't, you're going to spend a whole lot of money. We need chip. We need this one. We need that one. And we keep spending a lot of money. So here's the thing. I want to save you money and I want to save you time by just giving you one. Right? Would you rather 12 steps or one step? One step, amen. That's what I'm talking about. One step today. That's all we're giving you today. One step. You take the one step, and everything else will take care of itself. Now, here's the thing. Now, let's look at it one more time. Let's inspect it. Put on your glasses with me, those who have the glasses, so you can see clearly. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that who is going to do this? I 
All right, now notice the big eye. Okay? Verse number 33. So in the covenant contract, I will make with the house of Israel. What else is he going? I will put my laws in their hearts. I will write it in their hearts. I will be their God. What else? All right? And so by default, 34 is pretty much he's going to teach them because he says they don't need anyone else to teach them. So he's going to teach them. And he says also in 34 part B, that last part, I will forgive their iniquity. I will not remember their sins anymore. And when we go back over to Ezekiel now, let's go back over to Ezekiel again in case we missed it. Ezekiel chapter 30, what did I say? 36. And let us go now to verse number 25. He says, I will do the sprinkling of the clean water upon you, and when I do that, you shall be clean. It's not you trying to be clean anymore, but you shall be clean because I will do it. I will cleanse you. The end of that verse 25 also says that. 26, I will put a new heart also in you, and I will put a new spirit within you. Who is doing all the work? I am doing all the work. Why? Because God cannot fail. You can fail. I fail all the time, and he says, I'm tired of your failings. I will do it this time. But notice he says, in those days, in which days? In the last days. Who fulfilled this covenant agreement? Jesus Christ. We took communion recently, didn't we? And we read it every single time we do communion at least. This is the new covenant or the new testament in my blood. Did Jesus live up to all of the principles that are written in the scriptures? Amen. Amen. He did it. So the contract is ratified. The contract is sealed and it's a done deal because Christ's blood made it so. Christ says, for these people, they're going to keep backsliding. They're going to keep messing up. They're not going to keep your law and indeed they cannot keep it. So therefore, God can change his laws. So what's the solution? Well, I'm going to send my only son, and he will keep it perfectly for them. And when he keeps it perfectly for them, I look at that as the contract being fulfilled, and now I can grant them the blessings for which they seek. Oh, man. We got one amen on that. That's all right. That's all right. Let's, no, let's, look, let's, no, let's look at it. You want to study the Bible more. We want victory over sin because these are bad habits. We want to stop lying, stop cheating. We want to stop all these things because that's what sin is messing us up over and over and over again. Sin is causing these deliberating problems in our lives. We want more patience. Why? Because I'm not patient, right? We want more love because I'm unloving. Right? I get upset easy. Double cross me, man. I cut you off for a whole month. Don't talk to you, don't speak to you. Show up at church, I walk the other side. Sit down in my pew, I get angry just because you sit in my pew. I've been sitting there since the church started. Why are you doing in my seat, brother? You know, so these are the kind of things we get upset over. And so the Lord has to transform these things. And so we keep falling back into them. So the Lord says, I am, go because, and this is different now than self-help. The reason why I'm telling you this is because from God's word, we want to make sure that what we do is biblical and scriptural. Because here's the thing, unbelievers don't got to pray for discipline. Many of them are more disciplined than we are. Some of them get up to exercise religiously, faithfully, right? And they're not struggling. There are some people, they don't call upon God's name for no strength to get up and go exercise, do they? No, some of them, they, they're just who they are. They're just driven. Military folks, man, I, t I was telling a story sometime. That, you know, when I was in the military, listen, we got guys who will be smoking, and, you know, we got the physical readiness test, PRT, right? At least once every six months we have to do this test. We got to go through these physical obstacles and so forth. One of it is running, you know, 1.5 miles in a certain time. Now they've increased it, of course. But back then, I would have guys coming up smoking a cigarette, and then they just take off. And guess what, Brother Philip? They're beating me. And I'm like, hold on, man. I thought smoking was bad for you. But they, they, they got what? A system. One, of, one was my good friend from Kenya, James Orojo. James Orojo, man, just, no stretching, no nothing. And we out there early when they said PRT, like we get out there and everybody, you know, stretching, doing their thing. James just come up, woke up off his bed, and he's there. Where are we going? All right, 1.5 mile this way. Take off, two, three minutes. Nobody can see James again till the finishing line. He's from Kenya. It's like, this is easy. 
This is easy because they have a process. I don't know what they do over there, but they have a process. So they require minimal input. Me, I got to put a whole lot of input in, even with the good system and process the Navy gives. But James, James' system was not even of the Navy. That was it. Whatever they do over there, they're just good at running marathons. But here's the thing. I want now to bring it into perspective. I want to bring it into perspective. Here's the thing. Outcomes. So I want to have more prayer in my life. I want to be a prayer warrior, if you want to put it that way, right? What else do we want, spiritually speaking, right? We want to be holy. We want to be righteous, right? What else do we want spiritually? We want to have more reverence for God. Right? What else do we want? You see, these are the good things. This is good. The Bible said covet good. Covetousness is not wrong, but he said covet the good stuff. Right? Good. I want more love. Patience, faith. Oh, man, faith. Of course, faith is going to do it. Faith, as we're going to see in a second, is, 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 is how we possess this now. So what do we do over here? We got to try. Yes, we need to put in some input, but they're not the kind of input that we think of. See, when you want to change and achieve success, even so, let me put that over there because sometimes y'all think God only want to bless you like in your spiritual life. God want to bless every part of your life. He want to bless everything. Right? God wants you to have good grades. Isn't that important? You know, I'm a Christian. I'm representing God and you're getting these, 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 these. What kind of, what kind of witness is that? You know, so sometimes we think, oh, you know, God, no, God is concerned about those errors too. You can, you're my child, and you keep failing, failing, failing. Now, of course, some of us struggle, don't get me wrong. But I'm saying, it's not a good witness overall for a Christian to keep failing, failing in school. It's not a good witness. Because, I mean, God gives you intellect. God gives you wisdom. That's what I'm saying. You're not claiming your, your, your covenant promises. He says, if you lack wisdom, ask of me. So how come you can't get wisdom and you keep failing? Maybe you don't have, maybe you have a different God. Right? So God can do all of those things. So wisdom over here. All of these are the things that we want to. So what do we put in? What do we put in? What do we put in? This, let me, because we, we are experts over here. We love putting in stuff. So let me just give you the system that takes care of it all. And give you all the good habits that you will ever need. Okay? And it is called the new covenant. One system. My question is, do you trust the process? This is his process. It's not mine, it's his process. The new covenant is God's process of bringing all of these blessings into your life. You want sanctification? Well, justification goes first, right? And you want to be glorified, purified, whatever it is. There's a, there's a quotation in the Acts of the Apostles. It says, when we receive the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit brings every other blessing in his train. Every other blessing in his train. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, will the Holy Spirit cause you to be more patient and loving? If you are filled with God's Holy Spirit, will you have a desire to pray more? If the Holy Spirit of God is in you, does he purify your thoughts? Does he help you to become disciplined? Does he lead you into all truth? Yes, of course. And so that's why God says that when he puts his laws upon you, he's not only changing your heart, but he's also what? Giving you his spirit. Because your spirit is not going to do anything. So he says, I'm giving you both because he says it's the heart. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the heart are the issues of life. From the heart, you see, is what comes all these bad habits. That's what Jesus says. He says from the heart, that's why we come lying, adultery, and all of these different things. He said they flow from the heart. And Jeremiah, the same one prophet, says, where's what? The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. If you want to change your life, change your heart. Don't try to change your feelings and habits and behaviors. We're trying to change our behaviors, but that's who you are. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. You have no... Yes, sometimes, of course, you know, we want to do different things like that. And, of course, we can't... Let me read your quotation from Steps to Christ. Because there has to be a little difference there, right? So here's the thing. Steps to Christ. 
This is chapter 7 that deals with uh, the test of discipleship. He says, it is true that there may be an outward correctedness of deportment without the renewing power of Christ. It is true. That's what we're talking about. There are some people who don't know God, who don't follow God, they're not Christians, and guess what? They have good marriages, they have good health, and so forth, and they carry themselves respectfully and decently, Right? But that's not what we're talking about. So here's the difference now. She goes on. She says, the love of influence and the desire for esteem of others may produce a well-ordered life. You see that? Because they desire self-esteem and they desire, you know, to to be liked and those type of things, they can create some good outward um, behaviors. Self-respect may also lead us to avoid the appearance of evil. Notice what it says. Self-respect may also lead us to avoid evil. Of course. I don't want anybody calling me a liar. So I don't want anybody calling me a thief, so I don't go and steal because I value people's opinions of me. So that has nothing to do with God. I just, but you notice the selfish nature of that there. That's not motivated by love of God. That's motivated by what? My own desire for appearing good in people's eyes. She says, a selfish heart may perform generous actions. I give so others can say, people do that. You've heard, I've read a lot of success books talk about if you want to be, you know, well-esteemed in your society, go to nonprofit organization, give money there, and, and parlay with people who are giving big money. And the bigger the contributions is, the better perceived and received you'll be. That's a strategy for networking and being liked by other people. But here's the thing now. She says, by what means then shall we determine whose side we are on? And the answer, we, here's what we ask. Who has the heart? And with whom are our thoughts? Of whom do we love to converse? Who has our warmest affection and our best energies? If we are Christ, then our thoughts are with him, and our sweetest thoughts are of him, and all that we have and are is consecrated to him. We long to bear his image, breathe his spirit, do his will, and please him in all things. That's the difference. That's the difference. That's the difference. And that's why many of us don't get the kind of things we want also, because many times we are operating, I think Brother Oscar alluded to some of this in his talk this morning, is that we are operating on the worldly system of even financial management. And we wonder why we're not prospering the way God wants us to prosper. Because, yeah, if money is the only thing over here, then you are missing the mark. Because in Christ, you are truly wealthy. But there are many forms of wealth, see? Not only just material blessings. But that's what we say when we say, well, that's all we focus on. So we are running after these things. And here, God is saying, yeah, I, I'm going to bless you with these things. But here's the thing. I want to give you so much more than that. I got a heaven prepared for you. I got streets of gold you're going to be walking on. Why obsess your time with all of this stuff down here, trying to get it all? And listen, we're going to have it as pavement in the kingdom of heaven. Right? So when you come on the Christ banner and you participate in his covenant, God renews your heart, and this heart renewal creates in you a desire to be able to do things. Now, let me give you um, a quotation here from the Spirit of Prophecy in regards to this. Uh, it's, it's in the Youth Instructor. All right? She says, many people do not understand what it means. She's talking about this new heart now. They look for a special change to take place in their feelings. This they term conversion. Over this era, thousands have stumbled to ruin, not understanding the expression, you must be born again. That's the whole thing that we're talking about. In the new year, God does a new thing, and the new thing, he wants you to be a whole new person. That's why we just read, whoever is in Christ is a new creation, a totally new creation. Stop trying to become these things and be the new creation that God created you. So that's why he says when you are born again, He says, we're not born of this flesh, but we are born of spirit. And furthermore, because this sinful, evil heart loves to do wrong, that's why I keep struggling with these things. But when the character is reproduced in Christ, Christ gives you a new heart. And with that new heart, you have new desires and new affections. And the spirit motivates the actions. So we are still, and again, listen guys, this is important for you in this new year because stop fighting spiritual battles in carnal armor. It says the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they're spiritual. And the believer keeps reading all these self-help books and those are self-help. We need Christ's help. Right? They give you some help, but it's going to be at a temporal level. 
Self-help book does not regenerate your heart. It's only the spirit of God that can change your human heart and your human desires. You see? And so if we would reclaim the covenant blessings and the promise, because it's already written in the covenant, see? Brother Kapili, it's already in the covenant for you to be holy and righteous. Because notice he says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean. The problem is we have not read the covenant and we don't know the agreement, so we cannot appeal to those sections of the covenant. Because if I were in a covenant with Brother Judy and Brother Judy was not meeting the requirements of it, I would check him. I would say, Brother, here is the covenant agreements we have and you're not doing your part. Now, like I said, you got to change the way you pray now. Here's the thing. Here's, here's what I'm saying now. This covenant is, yes, we are, God made this covenant. We are part of the covenant, right? So, but will we fall short of the covenant time and time again? Yes, we will. Yes, we will. But here's what I'm telling you how to pray now, because this is the core ball. If the covenant says you shall be clean, if the covenant says you're supposed to have a new heart, a new spirit, God will cause you to walk in his commandments, his statutes and judgment. If God says that, here's the difference now. In other words, I'm saying if Brother Judy misses parts of the covenant, I'm going to say, Brother Judy, what's happening? Because I'm, hey, I'm, looking, I'm going to break this contract. By the way, in Hebrews, you know, he called this the, the new covenant. He says the everlasting covenant. There's no more covenants coming. This is the new covenant. He said, the new covenant made the old one vo void. He annulled it. It's done away with. But this new one, there's no more coming. There's not a third one to replace this one. This is it. This is the only covenant. So now, when God says you should be pure and you are impure, you can go to God and say, God, what's going on here? Notice the difference. Did you see the switch? If I messed up the covenant, Brother Oscar has a right to come to say, hey, Chance, we made a covenant contract. Just like we do with our bills, that's why the debt collector comes knocking on your door. Because you made a contract with them. Don't get mad at them. They say, hey, you owe me some money. And that's why I'm coming to you because you broke in your contract. I didn't get no payment this month. You said you're going to pay on, on the first of every month, on the fifth of every month. And you haven't paid for two, three months. But notice the difference now. God should be the one coming to me and saying, Chance, you messed up on this covenant. Chance, you did not pray like you said you were going to do these things. And I'm beseeching you today and I'm giving you a new perspective to say when these things are not happening in your life, you go to God and say, this is the new covenant that you made with me. God, why am I struggling in prayer? When your Holy Spirit is supposed to be in me and give me the desire to pray. You see the difference? It's a slightly different. I know we don't like to pray like that, but let me tell you, you got to change your praying. Stop focusing here. Lord, I need the input. What are the inputs? Submission. Holy Spirit. Those are the type of things he needs. Repentance. And faith, my brother, the ultimate of ultimates. That's what it is. If you don't believe God can help you to overcome something, you ain't going to overcome nothing. And it is not his fault. Why are we struggling so much with these bad habits? And we say we believe in God, and God is all powerful, and God can do all things. You have not trusted it, the process, the covenant process. He says he will do it. And if he says he will do it, we can take him at his word. You see, our promises, that's what I'm saying. Don't go and tell God you promise nothing. Steps to Christ again says what? Our promises are like ropes of sand. Matter of fact, the more we promise is the, is the weaker we become. You know why? Because every time you promise God and you fall short of it, your will, your confidence is weakened. Because you don't trust yourself now. You become even guilty. And now you have self-sabotage. Don't promise God nothing. God has already made the promises. <laughs> Trusted his promises. How am I going to promise God something? God has already promised everything. I'm promising him to be obedient. And he says, listen, if you do this, you're going to be obedient. If you surrender, if you submit, it's not about trying. I'm trying to be righteous. How are you going to be trying to be right? I'm trying to be loving. Think about what you're saying there. It's either you're loving or you're not loving. 
I'm going to try to be loving. No. Love is an action word. Love is a verb. Love is a noun. Love is an adjective. Love is totally possessive. It is a, it's about being loving. If you are loving, you do loving things. So an unlovable person trying to do loving things is an oxymoron. That's why she said, you know, people who don't know God, they can do these good things on their own. That's why 1 Corinthians 13 is so important. What does he say? Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and I have not love, I become nothing. You're like a sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. Even if I give my goods to feed the poor, it profits me nothing. Nothing. If I go on 10,000 mission trips and I don't have love, it profits me nothing. But when the love of Christ is in your heart, you will want to do as the Holy Spirit beckons you to do. Here's another quotation, Steps to Christ, chapter 5, on um, transformation or consecration. It says, those, there are those who profess to serve God while they rely upon their own efforts to obey his law. Right? Does he have health laws? Does he have discipline laws? Does he have success laws? He has all those laws, laws but we're not following them. And they want to form a right character to seek your salvation. But their hearts are not moved by any deep sense of the love of Christ. And she closes that section by saying, love to Christ will be the spring of action. Motive. You know why we also don't achieve our goals? We're not motivated. We're not motivated. So that's why we crank up these uh, motivational speakers and we go to the speaking circuits and read all, the, all those books because we get into a motivation. But she says, when the love of God is in your heart, the love motivates you. And now the action is pure. See the difference? Why? Because God is love. And when the love of God is in you, you become like him. We don't see it now. That's all right. Because by faith, we believe it. Not how we feel. We believe it because sanctification is the process and work of a lifetime. So he's working it out. He's perfecting your character. But in his eyes, it is done. It is you and I who have the issue. We have the struggle of seeing the here and now, but God already sees the completed action. That's why he pronounced upon you now, if you believe in me, you have eternal life. When do you have it? Now. Many of us wait until we get to heaven. Why wait until you get to heaven? You can get it now. So what do we need to do this morning? Many of us need to reevaluate our covenant blessings. I want you to go back because there are some of you, if you have not yet accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, then this morning, this year, you need to get in covenant agreement with God. You need to surrender to God, give him your life so that you can enter into the covenant blessings. But for those of us who are in the covenant already, we just have not read it. We have not read the full contract, brother and sister Alvarado. You have to now go back and read the full contract to experience all that is written in it. Because we are struggling, we are not happy, but they are already there in the contract. So here's what you do. You got to go and what? Claim the blessings that are yours. Right? Claim the blessings that are yours. Right? Now, here's the thing. Let me read it to you real quick, and then I, I'm going to go to real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Put your hands there. First Corinthians, I mean, 2 Corinthians, sorry. 2 Corinthians, I want to just go there. But while you are turning to that, let me read to you. In other words, if you are addicted, then you need to what? Overcome. If I am ill-disciplined and I don't exercise like I want to or eat like I want to, it's a problem. So I need to overcome that bad habit, right? So that's what we're looking for. Another word for overcome would be what? Victory. Can we say that? You want victory over sin? You want victory over bad habits, isn't it so? You want victory. I want to overcome my bad habits for the new year. Because if I overcome these bad habits, then now I can achieve these things right here. Right? So here's how we overcome. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, you are of God, little children, and you have overcome them. You are of God. And because you are of God, new covenant, you're in the con contract. He says, he who is in you is greater than he that is in the. And if God is in you, can you overcome sin? If God is in you, can he cause you to wake up and be disciplined? Yes. Stop reading Oprah and these other people to figure out how to do it. Read your contract agreement. Know your contract, your covenant is already, everything is there. Here's another one. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. For whoever is born of God, who, are you born of God this morning? 
So he says, if you are born of God, then you have overcome the world. <laughs> I have overcome bad habits, bad thoughts, bad words. I've overcome these things. Then how come am I getting it? I'm still seeming to be struggling with it. No, Oscar, that's what I said. Go to God now and say, hold on, Lord. Let me check the fine print real quick. Be a lawyer. Put on your glasses. Just hold on. In section 1 John, that section, you know, you got to use the lawyer kind of thing. So you say, Lord, this section of the law here says, and let me read it to you real quick. Maybe you might have forgotten. Whoever is born of God overcomes the world. Lord, I'm having a problem with that one because it seems like I'm not overcoming. But you told me that I am a son of God and whosoever believes in me, because you are a son now, he says, you give me power. Power. Lord, how come am I struggling? I don't have no power over sin. Go back to him. Lord, I'm asking you to do what you promise. Because I'm not promising it. You promise me that I'm going to be an overcomer. So if I'm not overcoming, there's a problem in the contract. And Lord, you already know I'm breaching the contract. But here's the thing. I believe in Christ. And Christ fulfilled the contract. And because he fulfilled the contract, I'm not supposed to be failing. Because when he is living in me, I live out his life. Your prayers will be answered, my brothers and sisters, speedily. Here's another one. So, Revelation chapter 2. So here's the blessing for overcoming now. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him who overcome, I will give to eat of the tree of life. 2 verse 11. He who that have an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. He who overcomes, guess what? This shall not be hurt by the second death. 17. Whoever overcomes, I will give him what? Some of the manna to eat. Come on, he that overcome it and keep my works until the end, he will have power over the nations. God has already prophesied and blessed you in your covenant agreement to be an overcomer. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our... Oh, there we go, the old scholar. Faith is the victory. We sing it all the time. How come you're not living in victory? You're breaching the contract. You go back and say, God, I cannot breach the contract. In Christ, he has fulfilled the contract. And he says, when I believe in him, he puts his spirit in me. And if your spirit is in me, then I'm supposed to be an overcomer. When your faith fails, you put your faith in Christ because the faith of Christ cannot fail. You say, Lord God, help me, give me, increase my faith. The disciples pray for increased faith. So it's okay. You say, Lord, increase my faith. If faith is what overcomes, then give me the faith to overcome. And by the way, Lord, fulfill it speedily because I don't have time to keep messing up. Bold prayers for this year, my brothers and sisters. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 2. I, right, Mr. Pianist, if you can come. And Brother Phil, we get our closing song ready. 2 Corinthians Chapter 3 gives us a wonderful illustration. And I'm giving you these things because I want you to be victorious in 2018. I don't want us to end this year. Oh, you know, I didn't accomplish this in the Lord. Even temporal. By the way, these things, there's no difference in my mind between temporal and spiritual. Listen, yet when you go to your job, God is there. It's not just in the church. God needs to be with you more in your so-called secular life than your spiritual life. Because this is our spiritual life. 30, 40, 50 minutes on Sabbath. You think that's, no, God is with you more. When you leave this building is where the, the real mission and ministry happens. Not in this building. This building is just a little pep talk for us to go back out and do something. Right? So take the Lord with you and stop saying my secular life, my spiritual life, my this life. No, you have one life. And that one life is a, it's all spiritual. The spirit of God is in you, your spiritual being. So no secular business here with the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 3. For as much, because now he's talking about now this new covenant, what happens under the new covenant, right? He says, for as much as you are manifestly declared to what? To the epistle of Christ, ministered to us, written, written how? Not with ink, but in the what? In the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but ah, upon the what? The heart, are you seeing the connection there? The old covenant was based upon that. Written on stone, the Ten Commandments, they couldn't keep it, and the other commandments, they couldn't keep them. 
So now he's saying, I'm going to do a new thing, a new thing in 2018. Is that good? Your new thing is your new heart. You got the new heart for this year? By the way, those who have a new heart enter into the new covenant. They have the new spirit of God because their old spirit is now, mm, right? And now he says, I give you a new spirit. And by the way, we're not go- remember I told you when we're going through the kingdom of heaven, he's going to give us a what? A new name. He's fulfilling his promise. What is he doing? Because he says, when you are entering into Christ, all things have become new. New spirit, new heart, new attitude, new word, new everything. A new name too. Do away with all of the old stuff. God doesn't want any of our old things. He says, I'm going to make it all new. So that's what I'm saying. You are on a new covenant. Are you operating on the old covenant? Can you imagine the computer you, 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 you right now operating on? Well, some of us still do. You know, you send an email and so some of us are still on Windows 1998 and Windows 2000. No, you need an upgrade. Upgrade to the new covenant. Upgrade to your new contract. I say, yeah, in the past I was up in the old covenant trying to do it all and still, you know, beating up myself because I missed the mark and I didn't win no soul. In the... Hey, listen, the new spirit of God can be in you right now. How do you possess this? By your faith. That's not a whole lot of work. He said, by faith. What does it mean? It, accept the word. You stand on the word like it's reality. What is he going to do? What is he going to do? By the way, he says the new covenant, you read there, continue there, is more glorious than the old one. He says, if you think the old one was glorious, then the new one, because it is sealed in Christ, and Christ fulfills it, he says the new covenant is way more superior than the old one. That's why he says, he annuls it in Hebrews chapter 8. I do with the old one. He says, this new one, you know why it's more superior? Because my son did every single thing that I asked him to do, and he fulfilled this law perfectly for all of us. So when you put your faith and trust in him now, he says, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells within us because it dwells in Christ. You're not living up to your contract. How bad do you want this contract this morning? Brother Phil, what song do we have there? 3.30, let's turn there. As we're singing, if you are here today and you want to reclaim those sections of your covenant agreement, come on down. Have a prayer with the Lord. And if there's anyone in the house today who have not yet entered into that new covenant, being married unto Christ, having been baptized, you can come on down as well. I'd like to have a word of prayer with you. But please come on down and renew your covenant agreement with Jesus Christ this morning.
person's hands next to you. I want you to do this. Take the person's hands next to you. And I want you to pray a prayer of blessing and benediction over the person to your left. Over the person to your left. Look around and see whoever is on your left. And I want you to pray a prayer of blessing over them. And pray also, those who came forward, we are praying. Pray for the renewal of your covenant agreement with God. Think about the sections of that covenant that you are not fully experiences and I'm experiencing and present them right now to Almighty God and ask Him, Lord, fulfill these things in my life in a tangible way. Yes, it helps our faith. We know sometimes we just got to do it our sin, but sometimes we need to see. So Lord, give me victory this year over this sin, this issue, this whatever it may be. And so let us do that and trust now and obey that when we pray this prayer, because God delights to answer his own words. He cannot lie. So what you're going to be doing right now is a prayer that God simply has to answer. All right? This is not presumption of the pastor. We are praying, this is your covenant, God. You made it. You sealed it. You said you do all these things. Now I need you to do it in me. Live out your life within me. That's why I love this song we just sung. You know what it says? Take my stuff. Take it. You, you take all of that section. Evangelism, you, you take it and do it in me. And so let us pray. In Heavenly Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, your people as they hold hand praying for one another, God, this morning, we have in many ways operated under the old covenant agreement in that we are still seeking of our own strength and effort to become what you've already pronounced us. This morning, yes, we know that there is something for us to do, but first we got to come to you in repentance, submission, and humility. And this morning we are asking you to even forgive us for operating upon a covenant agreement that you have already annulled. And we receive this morning again by faith, renewing our commitment and dedication and that we have entered into a new contract with Jesus Christ. Fulfill your covenant agreement in us. Indeed, wash us. Indeed, give us that new heart. Indeed, give us of your Holy Spirit. Not the trickling embers of the Spirit, but we are asking for a double portion, a drenching wetness of the Holy Spirit in 2018, God. We are tired of just barely having the Holy Spirit in our life. We want him to fill us all to the brim. So God, make sure that this year, Lord, whatever is required for you to fulfill your promises in us, God, bring it to pass. Bring it to pass. Let the church see how mighty and powerful that you are to save and to change and to transform our lives, oh God. Those bad habits, Lord, by Jesus Christ, through his blood and through faith, we accept this year that we will be victorious over these besetting sins, that we will be victorious over laziness. We will be victorious over not being been able to, to, to exercise and do these different things. We claim victory this morning that in Christ we are all these things and more and that we can overcome God help it to become a reality. Even now, we're not waiting for some time down the road. We are saying right now on profession of faith that God we have overcome in that area where we are struggling. We are claiming by faith right now through your Holy Spirit that you will give us the strength, the courage, and all that is necessary to overcome every besetting sin. Thank you for hearing and answering the prayers of your people. Dismiss us, send us home with your blessing, God. And I pray that this word will linger in our hearts. And indeed, we will be driven to reread the covenant agreement so we know exactly what is written in it. So that, Lord, we are not coming short of any blessing that you have afforded us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you have done, all that you are doing, and all that you will do in my life, in this church's life, in every man, woman, boys, and girl's life in this congregation. In Jesus' holy name, amen and amen. My brothers and sisters, God bless you. Live out a victorious life in 2018. And I'll see you in February. Pray for me as we depart on next week. God bless you.